Now, did you know, and it's a fact, you can go and Google it, and we're not saying Google is the ultimate source of all wisdom and knowledge, it's not, God is. <laughs> the other day, I asked the Lord, Lord, what will we do in the tribulation if we are not allowed, if we don't take the mark of the beast and we're not allowed to Google anymore, how will I know what to do? <laughs> because these days you everything, you don't know how your dishwasher works, you Google it, you don't know how your, to fix this, you Google it. And the Lord said, the Buddha, then you'll ask me and I'll tell you. And actually, the Lord tells us, if we will just ask Him, they, all wisdom and all knowledge is in the Lord. But yeah, for now, for time being, we, can, we may Google, it's not wrong. And if you, if you look on the internet, you will see that it's a fact that the ancient Egyptians circumcised already 5,000 years before Christ. And Abram lived about 2,000 years before Christ. That's interesting. Did they then, did they then believe in the same God as Abram? Because is it the same God? Because if the one says circumcise and the other one says circumcise, that's all, those are the questions. Other heathen nations that also circumcise that we know of is Austral Australasian Aborigines, the uh, Islam, the Muslims, some of the men in, in Islam circumcise. And not for health reasons or all that. There's many reasons why people may circumcise, not for health reasons or religious regions, reasons. Judaism. We know in Judaism, on the eighth day still, the babies get circumcised. In tribal Africa, there's circumcision. I'm sorry about the, explicit, uh, the explicitness of the, the pictures, but we are a grown-up bride of Jesus Christ, and we need to look these facts in the eye. There's a thing that they call the buttonhole circumcision in Kemet, African circumcision history. Tribal Africa associated widely with paganism and sun god worship. Now, we all know that Satan is a counterfeiter and he wanted to be as God. And he wants to be worshipped by man. And he hates the fact that man was created in God's image. <coughs> he wanted man to be in his image. And we know now what happened in the Garden of Eden. Sexual intercourse between man and woman and Satan. And and. When man and woman has sexual intercourse, the, site, the seed of Satan gets inherited through the generations. And look at that uh, obelisk. That's the one there at the Vatican. We all know that, that that's the fertility cult of Freemasonry, of, of, the, of the cults of Satan's kingdom. It's all based on fertility. That obelisk we know is a symbol of the male phallus. Now, if, if this is a bit strange to you and you say, I don't know, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a long shot, I don't know if this is the truth. Let us look at, because I asked when, I, when we drafted this teaching, we asked and I said, Lord, but show me, I know this is your truth. You show it to me by the Holy Spirit, but show me the truth. Explain it to me. And the Lord said, the Buddha, look at the staff of Kedushas. And I Googled it, Googled it and I got that the staff of Kedushas is the one there that has got that rod in the middle with the two wings and the two snakes. What do we know that staff of Kedushas? It's the sign of pharmakaya, of the medicine fraternity. What does it really depict? It depicts the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The seed of Satan in us, the false, the counterfeit healing by pharmakaya. What is that rod in the center? It's a three. We know in the Eastern religions, they call it the Ida, Pingala, and Sushumna channels of the, of the rising of the Kundalini. The male force, the female force that gets married, and then the, it gives rise to the spirit of the Antichrist or the Kundalini that rises up. Which one is that one in the middle? You tell me. Yeah, the Sushumna, and that is the Kundalini. Spirit of the Antichrist. And the Lord said to me, look at the resemblance, Deborah. That's what, that's what Lucifer wanted to depict. Can you see? My image in you. Okay, but Deborah, that's not yet uh, for me too convincing. Let's look further. The staff of Kedushas and Yesot. Yesot in the tree of knowledge is the energy center point. That one that is pink. Can you see where the male organ is? The pink one. That is Yesot. Can you see in the Kabbalistic tree of knowledge where it's located? Can you see? Right. Let's read what they say 
about it. I got this on, a, on the internet on yashanet.com. Yesod plays the role of connecting the Sifirot of Tiferet. The Sifirot is the tree of, uh, look, they call it the tree of life, but it's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of knowledge and evil, good and evil of Tiferet, the male above. Can you see where Tiferet is on the picture? Let's go back. Yeah, you must see it there. Tiferet is just above. Do you see Tiferet? Mm -hmm. Tiferet, the male above, that energy center to Malkut, the female below. As such, it is metaphorically associated in Kabbalistic writings with the male sexual organ, which connects the body of man to woman. It is thus also identified with circumcision. Eventually, the child becomes a son of the commandments at his bar mitzvah, as likened to Tiferet, the son of Torah. Interesting. Let us look at what is written on a website called Shabbat.org. They say, the commandment God, the Lord, commanded the Jewish people, Leviticus 12 verse 2, on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. The act of circumcision marking the completion of the body is a human act. This teaches us that our spiritual, emotional, moral, and ethical perfection requires human effort. God cannot do it for us. What is that other than giving honor to Lucifer? We have to do it ourselves. Doesn't it sound like the Freemasonry? We have to perfect ourselves by, by becoming better people, good works. God cannot do that for us. We must do it ourselves. The Brit rit ritual circumcision is a symbol of our partnership with God, etched in the flesh of our physical bodies. The covenant will, will never end or be forgotten. This is known as Brit Mila or Bris. Now, I'm sorry for this, but Bride of Jesus Christ, you have to, we have to realize these things. The Orthodox Jews, in some circles, I'm not saying everybody, but that is part of their ritual. They have the ritual of sucking the blood of the circumcision immediately after the circumcision by the Mohel. The Mohel is the one that is like the priest that does the circumcision in the synagogue. They call it that word, I can't even pronounce it, is a time-honored tradition codified in the most important Jewish scripts. I just ask you, Bride of Jesus Christ, who's got Jesus Christ living inside of you, you've got an intimate relationship with Jesus. You know him personally. Does it sound like your God? Before Mount Sinai, the Israelites were only in marriage covenant with Lucifer. I'm not speaking here about Abraham and, and um, Noah and those who had personal covenants with the Lord. I'm speaking about in general. After the fall, there wasn't any marriage covenant with God, our God, Jesus Christ. There was only marriage covenant with Lucifer. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, etc. had an activated Kundalini. Although I have to qualify that, they also heard from the Lord. And the seed of God was still there, so they still had the ability to believe in the true God. But as with many of us these days, we are the bride of Jesus Christ, and, and many of us still have activated Kundalini in us because of things that we've done that we didn't know is are right, or it's because of the bloodlines, un, unbroken bloodline covenants, and the Kundalini is still there and it can be active. Why not so for them? You see, the, the thing is, we have this concept of the fathers of our faith in, in, in the Old Testament that they were infallible. They were like saints. They weren't saints. They were people like me and you, and they were fallible people. But I'm not trying to belittle them to say that it activated Gunilini. I'm just saying, let's look the truth in the eye. They were not in marriage covenant with God in general. I'm not speaking about Abraham and those who had a covenant with the, with the Lord in person. <laughs> But there was an activated Kundalini because of what happened in the garden. They were fallible people just like you and me. They may also have heard from Lucifer, Baal, Satan on the inside. Because if you have activated Kundalini in you, there's, there's, there's a voice in you which counterfeits him as God himself. So you think you are hearing from God. Let me ask you this, bride of Jesus Christ, who, who listens to this teaching can really truly say to me that you have not 
ever in your life been deceived by thinking that you hear from Jesus and later on you discovered, oh, but then that couldn't have been God. That then, how could I have I've been so deceived? So then who was it that deceived you? If it wasn't Jesus, then, then there was another voice. Except when God stepped in. In the Old Testament, that's why we often read of angels appearing to people. When, when uh, the Lord made a promise to Abram in the desert and to, to his wife that she will become pregnant with Isaac, angels came and visited them and, and brought them the, the message. The Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush. I get goosebumps if I think about it. How awesome. He appeared to him in the, and a voice spoke to him out of the burning bush and the bush continued burning and burning and burning and it didn't burn out. So the Lord stepped in and he... he he, he interfered, I almost want to say, and he, he grabbed his people and he said, I'm calling you, I'm calling you, I'm calling you. But in general, we must remember they lived among heathen nations. Everybody all around them were worshipping idols and were, were sacrificing children and were doing blood rituals and were... So it just gives us the context. What did Jesus say when he spoke? You know, because we, we're talking here about the imagery of the snake, Satan, in the bodies of the Israelites. What did Jesus say when he spoke to the Pharisees and the scribes of his time? Matthew 12, verse 34, he said, O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Matthew 23, verse 33, Yes, serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? That's Jesus' own words. So he must have known there's a connection with a snake somewhere there. Jesus knew the mysteries because he's all-knowing. He's God. He knows everything. And he was there, actually, in the Garden of Eden. He knows everything. And he knows that the Pharisees and the scribes were in covenant with Lucifer. And they heard, mostly so, from the Kundalini inside of them. Now, where the Lord showed me personally this thing about the circumcision, and I got a big fright. I almost wanted to leave the teaching and say, Lord, I'm not going to, to continue with this because it's, it's too much. I can't, I can't say, tell the people this, Lord. But where this revelation came is when I read about what happened to Moses, because I read in Genesis where the Lord called Moses at the burning bush. And I remember the time when the Lord called me. I got goosebumps and I said, oh, Lord, Moses had a, a, a personal meeting with you. Because that's what happened when the Lord called us. It was like, like, you just know it was the Lord. And it must have been awesome. And, the, and he said, Lord, but I cannot speak. And, the, and, and God said, no, I'll send you Aaron. He will speak on your behalf and he'll speak. Lord, but how will they believe me? No, I will give you miraculous wonders. Yeah, throw your staff. It will become a snake. This sign, this wonder, I will give all these things to you to show the Pharaoh that you are coming uh, in the name of the true God. Lord, what, what, what shall I say to the Israelites? Who are you? Who sent me? And the Lord said, I am. I am who I am. I am sent you. I'm the God of your fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I thought, oh, Lord, how wonderful that must have been to Moses to have that encounter with God at the in the desert, at this burning bush. Awesome. And I, re I resonated, my, the spirit of the Lord in me and my spirit resonated with what happened there in the desert. I could resonate with that. I said, yes, that's my Lord. That's my God. What do I read next? Exodus 4, verse 24, verse 26, at the encampment where they are on their way back to Egypt, it's him and his wife Zipporah and their children, and maybe some slaves or other people that went with him, servants rather, at the encampment, the Lord met him, Moses, and sought to kill him. I said, Lord, that couldn't have been you. You've just spoken to Moses in the desert and you've, you've equipped him, you've called him, you said to him, no, don't worry about your speech, I'll help you. Don't worry about this, I'll help you. I am, my name is I am. You could have told him then at the burning bush, but Moses, just be careful then, circumcise first before you return. How could you on the one hand call Moses? He must have been in this hype going back to Egypt. The next minute you 
want to kill him. Surely you could have spoken to him. If you spoke to him at the burning bush, you could have appeared to him at the encampment or send an angel and tell him, Moses, my servant, before you go back to Egypt, just circumcise before you go. Why did you want to kill him? Why would you want to kill someone that you've just called? And this is where I got the revelation. And I heard on the inside, the Holy Spirit said to me, it wasn't me, the Buddha. I said, Lord, if it wasn't you, then who was it? The Lord said, it was the other one. And there, <laughs> this teaching became very difficult. I said, Lord, no, I don't know. But then the Lord started to break it open for me. What happened there? Zipporah then. And if, if we can infer there from killing that Moses got very ill, maybe he, 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 got, he got seriously ill, he want, almost wanted to die. So Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off. You know, there were no anesthetic in those days. Can you think as a mother, those of you that are mothers of sons, and that child must have been already grown up, ne? To tell that son, come, I, I'm going to circumcise you now with a sharp stone, without anesthetic. And cut off the foreskin of her son, and she cast it at Moses' feet, saying, surely you are a husband of blood to me. And when she did that, he let him, Moses, go. So he, he started to recover. And then she said, you are a husband of blood to me. And I asked the Lord, what did she mean by that, Lord? And what the Holy Spirit told me is, let's look at the next slide. The Lord, in inverted commas, wanted, that it, that wanted to kill Moses, was the God whom Zipporah knew from her father's home. The Midianites descended from Midian, a son of Abram through his concubine Keturah. Yetru, her father, we know about Yetru. Ne? Her father was the priest of Midian. And he honored Yahweh. Or Baal. But try and put yourself in the picture and in the place of those first fathers of our faith. And Moses included. They did not have the Bible as us. They did not have Jesus Christ who died for them. They did not have, I, I doubt if they even had scriptures or they had what was told to them by their father and mother what happened in the Garden of Eden and how God promised to be with them and that there's this God. But there's other people also saying, but they also, they also serve God. And then Yetru says, I also serve God. And how do you discern? They didn't have the Holy Spirit. Very important. Thank you, Jays. Thank you, Jays. They didn't have this Holy Spirit. We are circumcised by the Holy Spirit. Our, when we got reborn, our spirits were circumcised. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And if, if we are spiritful believers, it means the tree of life in us is ignited. It's as if, can you remember in our days when we were still children, we had a Christmas tree? <laughs> and I'm not saying the Christmas tree is a good thing. It's a bad thing. But actually, that's a counterfeit. That was a counterfeit symbol of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But if you can just for once picture it as a tree of life, what would we do? We, we put the lights in and then we, and we switched on the lights. And then the tree had the lights in it. Can you remember as a child and how we were in awe about the lights? But that's a counterfeit. Christmas is not of the Lord, but that's a counterfeit of the original. When we are reborn and spirit filled, it's as if the lights go on in us. The light of God, Jesus Christ. We are enlightened by the Holy Spirit. We can now look at these things and say, hey, but wait a, min wait a minute. That doesn't sound like my God. And Yetro, the priest of Midian, uh, who says he, he served the same God? I doubt it. He was the priest of Midian. They were Midianites. And we read later on in the Old Testament in the Bible that they were all pagans. They, they, worshiped, they didn't worship the God of the Israelites. So, the God that called Moses at the burning bush and the Lord who wanted to kill him and accepted the blood sacrifice was not the same God. He, Satan, is the bloody bridegroom from the Garden of Eden. Can you see how the dots start to get connected? If you understand what happened in the Garden of Eden, Satan is the bloody bridegroom. And through the circumcision and sexual intercourse, every man becomes a husband of blood. The sign of the blood covenant with Lucifer to his wife. That's what she meant. And probably Zipporah, on the way back to Egypt, 
already mentioned to Moses, you know, Moses, my family. But this is the other thing I want to mention to you. Remember, Moses grew up in Egypt. So what we can maybe infer, we haven't got proof of it, but maybe he was already circumcised as an Egyptian because he grew up in the palace. So for him, it's okay. But Zipporah may have said to Moses before even, but uh, um, Moses, but our children need to be circumcised and he, 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 he has heard from the true God and he didn't hear circumcised. So he said, no, but the Lord didn't say circumcised. We are going back to Egypt. And he didn't want to listen. And then when he fell very ill and he almost died, she came to me and said, yes, you see, I said, us women, can, can we, can we uh, <laughs> um, relate to that? I told you, ne? you should have done that. And then she took, took it in her own hands. And, and the mere fact that it was done by a woman in those days, Ne? She took it in her own hands and she circumcised her son and she threw the foreskin before him and she said, you, you are a bloody husband to me. And then when he healed, isn't that the false counterfeit kundalini healing? Because the counterfeit also heals, counterfeit healing. When he got better, she said, you see, I told you, you are a bloody husband to me. She said, we have to keep the traditions of our forefathers by circumcision. You... That blood covenant must be carried forward. In Joshua 24 verse 2, did you know that Joshua says there, Abram was raised by idol-worshipping parents. Go and read what it says in Joshua 24 verse 2. What does that say to us? In Abram's mind, there must also be this dualism from these gods that he knew in the country where he stayed with his parents and then the God that called him and say, Abram, you must go away to a land that I will show you. I've got a great destiny for you. A great people will be born from you. They, in, in them, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So in Genesis 12, verse 1 to 9, God calls Abram. But just look how interesting. You know, if the Lord enlightens you with his Holy Spirit and you can look at these things as the Lord looks at it, you can see, look at the strategy of the enemy. Just after the calling, Abram and Sarai went to Egypt. Egypt. And what happened? Abram traded with the Egyptians, sold his wife to the Pharaoh, and lied that she was his sister. Now, with the knowledge that we have today, would we say that that opened spiritual doors to the enemy? <laughs> Did they circumcise in Egypt? Okay. And then there after Genesis 15, God enters into a holy covenant with Abram and we know what happened there. And then it says there, interesting, just go and read in the word again. It, it says, and God further said to Abram. It's as if God already spoke. And then it says, and God further said to Abram, you must circumcise. How should we understand this? The Old Testament people did not have a Bible. We agreed on that. The, their concept of God and who he really is was blurred. The counterfeit on the inside, Kundalini, constantly tried to deceive them and lured them to the idols. Many peoples and nations use the word God and Lord to, to refer to their gods. For example, both Baal and Yahweh means Lord. Did you know that? Baal, the word Baal means Lord. And Yahweh is based on that sacred name thing. yod heh vav He, y h v h means Lord. So everybody calls their God Lord. The so-called sacred name of God, YHVH, means Lord. The original Torah was written in Paleo Hebrew. We must also remember that people think that the Hebrew Bible as we know it today is like the original Hebrew. It's not the original Hebrew. It's far from that. The original uh, Torah, the first five books of Moses or were written in Paleo-Hebrew. That is like, how can we describe that? It's not pure Hebrew. It's like a, a combination of Ar Aramic and other nation, uh, languages that they put together. The word Lord, when the word Lord is found in standard capitalization, it's representing the word Adonai. Did you know that? In the Bibles that we read, most of them. Adonai the Lord, used as a 
proper name of God only, my Lord. This can be compared to how we speak to God today using the name Jesus or Father. The word Lord, all in capitals. Can you see Lord, all in capitals? Go look at your Bibles. It's really like that. Sometimes the Lord is not in caps and other times it's in capitals. When the word Lord is found in all capital letters, it's representing the word Yehovah, the self-existent or eternal, the Jewish national name of God. God. Transliterating the f word form Hebrew to English, we get the letters Y-H-W-H or J-H-V-H. That is what we call the tetragrammaton, meaning four letters or four consonants. The Jews held this name of God as sacred and did not pronounce it. Scribes later inserted vowels, giving us the names Yahweh and Yehovah. Interesting. Did you know this? The Masoretic text is used as the basis for most. That's uh, Hebrew. The Hebrew Masoretic text is used as the basis for most Protestant translations of the Old Testament, such as the King James Version, English Standard Version, New American Standard Version, and New International Version, the 93, the 33 Afrikaans Bible, and also the Tanakh, the Hebrew Old Testament, uses as the ground text, the Masoretic text. That began around the 6th century after Christ and, and it was completed in the 10th century after Jesus Christ by scholars at Talmudic academies in Babylonia and Palestine in an effort to reproduce as far as possible the original text of the Hebrew Old Testament. Do you think there is space for people that wanted to mingle with the, with the name of God? Is, is there a possibility? Okay. The Masoretic text, one thing that seems to be clear, the original Paleo-Hebrew scriptures were tampered with. Look what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 8, verse 8 and 9. How can you say we are wise? And the law of the Lord is with us. Remember, this, was, this is just before the Babylonian exile. Look, the false pen of the scribe certainly works falsehood. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? So Jeremiah comes against them and he says, even the word of God you have polluted and you have mingled with it. He talks about the scribes there. The scribes are the ones that wrote the, the word of the Lord and that kept the scriptures and the scrolls. We as reborn spiritual believers have this Holy Spirit in us to help us discern. The tree of life is germinated and alive in each of us. We have the mind of Christ. That is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. We have the mind of Christ. The first believers after the fall did not have this. The tree of life, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit in them was dead except the seed. And the spirit of Lucifer Kundalini was activated and alive in them. Surely they may have heard from God to circumcise in inverted commas. And believe that the command is coming from the same God that had just called Abram. And just think logically. You know, Jaius has a wonderful saying. Jaius, I, 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 I uh, quote you here and there. <laughs> but Jaius has a wonderful saying. He says, you know what? The most, one of the most awesome gifts of the Holy Spirit is common sense. Which very few people use, he says. You see, I bring you in here. Eh? But think with your common sense logic, if there wasn't a marriage covenant with God at the time of, time of Abraham, because people confuse this. You see, the enemy wants us to get it confused. There was a covenant with Abraham, but it was a personal calling and a promise. It wasn't a marriage covenant between God and a people. Not yet. So if there's no marriage covenant, how can a sign of a marriage covenant be necessary? Except if there was already a marriage covenant with the other one from the Garden of Eden. And he wanted that sign to be inflicted. Just think logically. Common sense? Logic? Okay. The Israelites' dualism. The Israelites had a dual concept of God. The true God, Jesus Christ, who called Abram and appeared to Moses in the burning bush. And the spirit of Lucifer. Sun God Baal that spoke through the awakened Kundalini inside of them. Both were known as God and Lord. Another example is 
the God that commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. What do we know about the heathen gods, Molech? Baal. Baal and Molech is the same, actually. Just different cultures. Sacrifice the firstborn on the hills. What did Abraham do? He heard from the Lord, sacrifice your son. He loaded the donkey, took his son. His wife must have been in a terrible state. There they go up the hill. He's going to sacrifice Isaac. Now, you may rightly so say, yes, uh, the Buddha, but we also, we also learned that and we heard teachings that the, our God, Jesus Christ, tested Abram. And I think it's true. The Lord allowed it. Remember, we must discern between who instructed versus allowed. Our God will never instruct anybody to sacrifice these children. That's not our God's personality. It's not his character. I, I refuse to believe that about my Jesus that I know. But he can allow it to test Abram. Because I know for sure that many people that, that are called, even in today's terms, they get tested before the time. And the enemy comes against them and, they say, and the enemy says to, to, to our God, to Jesus, he will never make it. He is to this, he's to that, he's to this, he's to that. And then our God agrees and he says, okay, let's see. I know, I know what I've got in this person. I've created him. I know. I'll allow it. Test him. Let's test him. But the Lord knows what will happen. And then you get tested and you pass that test and the Lord says, now you can go. Now you have been found Obedient, righteous, even unto that you were obedient. So you have, you can be the father of all believers to come. Because that was what Abram was. The father of all believers to come. Today we are the children of Abram spiritually. So it's a big calling. So the Lord allowed it, but he didn't instruct it. Circumcision, the sign of marriage covenant with Lucifer. Why did God allow it? Why did God allow the circumcision for so many generations, upon generation, upon generation? Because there's many texts, verses in the Old Testament, rightly so, where we read of circumcision. Many. I asked the Lord the same question. And this is what I heard. The marriage covenant made with Satan in the Garden of Eden was eternal. A covenant, those of you that are in the law, as we are, I've studied law. Jay has also studied law. There's other people here that studied law. A covenant is entered into with God, with a God, with God. It's a spiritual thing. It's a covenant and it's eternal. The essence of a covenant is it, it cannot be broken. It's, it's against the nature of a covenant. <laughs> so if you break covenant, breaking of covenant at Mount Sinai would have given Satan, because what happened at Mount Sinai? They entered into a holy marriage covenant with Jesus Christ, with our God, Jesus Christ, God the Father, Jesus Holy Spirit. If you are a married person and you decide, but I'm going to marry someone else now, then you are automatically breaking covenant with the other bridegroom, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They broke covenant with Satan at Mount Sinai. That would have given Satan the right to kill the Israelites in the flesh. And here I want to give... Uh, Jay has an opportunity to explain to you what he found when he ministered in a ministry where they worked with survivors that come out of Satanism. What happens to people who want to break covenant with Satan? We have a saying, and that's, even if you are not in the spiritual sphere, people use this saying, this adage. He's got your number. And that's what's happening to people that want to come out of Satanism. I've experienced it for three years. They will not allow any person that has entered into an agreement a or blood, a, covenant, a, covenant. a blood covenant with Satan, with Lucifer, with Molech, you name whatever God uh, falls under that category or in that category. They will never allow that person to go to Christ or to turn to Christ. They will pursue that person until that person is back. And if that person isn't back in Satanism, they kill that person. I personally know of a, of a situation 
where there was a curse spoken by the Satanists that when this woman uh, should ever come to Christ, she will die seven years after her rebirth. I can't explain to you why seven years are not six or 11. I personally know the people that ministered to her. Lo and behold, seven years after she uh, got converted and reborn in Christ, she died. Like this. If Satan has your number, he has your name written in his book of death. Unless God, our God, the God of the Bible, protects that person, that person will either die physically or spiritually, killed by the people in Satanism. It is, it is there is no words to describe it. They pursue that person across countries. Sorry, Jason, and can one say it's yes. because of the breaking of covenant, because it's a blood covenant. You don't make a covenant Correct. with Satan Correct. without blood. Correct. And a blood covenant is an eternal blood covenant, and if it's broken, that it gives the enemy the right to kill in the flesh. Correct. Not necessarily in the spirit, uh, yeah. because that lady, we, we believe that her spirit went to heaven. Correct. Correct. But in the flesh... Uh, because of the blood covenant that was broken, no. except no. if, yeah. And there's various uh, uh, rituals that they perform to get a person into a covenant with, with Satan. I'm not going into detail. I can't even remember everything. But it always entails blood. And just something else, I'm, uh, I'm not sure whether <laughs> um, the <sighs> this, is a, this is a thing which people don't understand. When you have intercourse, that's what I learned when I worked there. Intercourse is nothing else than a blood covenant. Although there's no blood physically, after the, let's say, there's sex between a man and a woman and the woman was a virgin. There's only blood during the first intercourse. The second or third or fourth intercourse, there's no blood. But in the spirit, there's blood. So what they taught me is that every time you have sex with a partner, or with somebody else, it's like a blood covenant. In the spiritual realm, the occult see it as a blood covenant. Thank you very much, Jace, for that valuable input. I think because very little of us have experience of that type of thing, um, working with survivals in Satanism, we don't know these things. But um, obviously the Lord can supernaturally protect those people, and we've also seen that. But they are being pursued by Satan their whole life to try and kill them. If he cannot kill them spiritually to bring them back to the coven, the second best is kill them in the flesh. Yeah. So that helps us understand because, and thank you for that also, Jase, where you mentioned that the intercourse is a blood covenant. <clears throat> so what happened in the Garden of Eden between man and Lucifer was a blood covenant. It's important to understand that. So breaking of the covenant at Mount Sinai with Lucifer, breaking of the covenant with Lucifer because they entered into a marriage covenant at Mount Sinai with a true God, would have given Satan the right to kill the Israelites in the flesh. You agree with me? God does allow the circumcision to preserve and protect his people from whom the Messiah had to be born. Remember, this was all about the Messiah that needed to come. God's ultimate aim was not to just tabernacle with these people in the desert. This was the second best thing for the interim. The plan was... The Messiah that had to come. So this lineage of Israelites had to be preserved. If they fought against the heathen nations when they went into Jericho or into Canaan to take over the land and they got killed because of Satan's curse and clapping them in the flesh, the lineage out of which the Messiah had to be born would not have been preserved. So God in his mercy allowed it. Remember, we must discern between allow and instruct. The blood sacrifices of the circumcision satisfied Satan and he could not kill the Israelites who entered into a holy marriage covenant with God at Mount Sinai. The marriage covenant with Satan could only be broken by a blood sacrifice strong enough. And that is the Lamb of God. Only the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, his godly blood would have been strong enough to cancel that covenant with Satan once and for all. For everyone that accepted him as Savior. 
He who had no sin became sin for us also in circumcision, because you will know that Jesus also got circumcised on the eighth day as a little Jewish boy. And I asked the Lord, because someone said when we started to discuss and brainstorm this amongst each other, this is really a product of the bride because many people gave input. And I thank the warriors that are journeying with Ignited in Christ for all their input. Many of them, they know who they are. I thank you. And then brainstorming out, then we brainstormed this. And someone said, no, but that can't be because Jesus was also circumcised. And I said, yes, Lord, why were you then also circumcised? Father, why did you allow your own son to be circumcised? And immediately I got the answer in my spirit. The Lord said, because it had to be taken on the cross. The sign of the covenant, the marriage covenant with Lucifer, had to be taken on the cross. That curse needed to be broken. Um, people, I'm just going to give you a testimony about uh, something that happened to me. It bothered me um, a couple of years ago. This question. What blood type did Jesus had, or have, what's the word, have. You get various forms of human blood types. And sometimes when I ask the Lord, Lord, give me the answer just before I sleep. He deposits it in my spirit. I can't tell you how. I can't tell you how, how it works. All I know is that when I woke up that next morning, I didn't even tell my wife that I asked the Lord to give me the answer. The following words come, came out of me. My blood type is not known to mankind. Because it's godly blood. It's not human blood. And I started crying and I said, Lord, explain it to me. His blood is godly blood. Mm. It can't be of a human nature because God was without sin, including his blood. Thank you for that, Jace. Um, and someone just mentioned also that we must just remember that Jesus was born perfect, perfect. Every baby is born perfect. Just ask yourself, why would our God, Jesus Christ, want to mutilate someone that is born perfect? Perfect. For a reason. Everything is for a reason. We are created. He makes no mistakes in the way that he's created us. The circumcision had to be carried through so that Jesus could take it upon him on the cross. And you know what? When this revelation fell in my spirit, I wanted to cry because it was so big for me. Because we always talk about what Jesus did for us on the cross. Do we really understand what he's done? And the weight of the curse of all humanity that he took upon him. And that anger and that rage of Lucifer, of people that are going to break covenant with him, was, was taken out on Jesus. He died. He paid the price of the broken covenant so that we can now stand only in a marriage covenant with Jesus Christ when we accept him as Savior. It's too much for, a human, for, for our human understanding. <laughs> he died so that the curse, shame, and covenant of death with Satan could be broken over all humankind who would accept him as Savior. It's, it's so big. It's too big for our human understanding. Right, then let's run quickly through the following slides. I think we all know this, but I'm just going to state it for, for the sake of the record. The first old marriage covenant with God was... God proposed to the Israelites, his chosen people, an interim way unto salvation. Again, a marriage proposal made by God to his people at Mount Sinai. If they would obey and keep his commandments, they will live. The law must be kept together with repentance and atonement. Now again, envy there. Blood sacrifices of animals. Blood sacrifices of animals. We tend to think the blood satisfied Jesus, our God. It didn't satisfy him. He, he doesn't want blood. It satisfied the anger of Satan because of the sin. He had legal right to punish the people because of the sin. So the Lord said, give him the blood of the animals so that he won't hurt you to preserve his people. In the blood sacrifices of animals, atonement for sin, the Aaronic priesthood, the high priest atoned for the sins of the people in the Holy of Holies. 
I'm jumping over this fairly quickly, but we all know that and we can go and read it again in the Bible as well. The Israelites broke marriage covenant with Lucifer because if you are married and you have a intimate relationship with someone else, then you are breaking covenant with the one that you are married to. Ne? Logical. The sign of the covenant with Lucifer, Baal or the sun god, was made with blood and was carried out in their flesh. Our God does not want blood. Satan wants blood. Our God is not a fertility God. Obsessed with sexual organs. Satan is. Because of what happened in the Garden of Eden, the mysteries. Circumcision resembled the tree of knowledge and Satan's seed in them, the fertility cult. The sign of their covenant with the true creator God, Jesus Christ, who created everything in six days and rested on the seventh day was the Sabbath. There can't be two signs of the covenant. Because I also reasoned with the Lord when we were drafting this teaching. I said, Lord, but people talk about the circumcision as a sign of the covenant. The Lord said, okay, Deborah, let's start at the beginning. Get the covenants separated. What covenant are we talking about? Marriage covenant. Okay. Was there more than one marriage covenant with the Israelite people with God? No, only at Mount Sinai. Okay, but if it says in Exodus 31, the 16 and 17, the Lord said, the sign of your covenant with me that you are my chosen people will be the Sabbath. Then it is the Sabbath. Then it can't be the Sabbath and the circumcision. Okay? It, it actually makes a lot of logical sense if we just pause on it and think about it. What does it say? Siela, pause and think about it. The, the sign of the covenant with Jesus Christ is a Sabbath. And you know what? When I read that, I said, yes, Lord, that's you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. That's the Lord I know intimately. The Sabbath. Because he wanted all the heathen nations. There's no other nation that celebrates Sabbath. It distinguishes them. It sets them apart from all the heathen nations. The heathen nations sacrifice to their idols. Blood, blood sacrifices. They sacrifice on the hills their firstborn. They circumcise. They do all those things. Only one sign separates them from all the other nations, the Sabbath. And it, it, it shows that they are worshipping the true God because it's got to do with the God of creation. Six days, he created everything. Seventh day, he rested. So... So they could show all the heathen nations, we are worshipping the true God, the creator. Not all these other counterfeits. All the nations could see that they are truly set apart as God's nation. The nature of a covenant is that it is eternal and might not be broken. So if it's broken, there's legal consequences. We know that even in marriage covenant today, if you broke covenant, there will be consequences. You can't just walk away. These consequences. You made a promise. <laughs> Me? Me? I'll take you to court. And the court will say, you have to pay me and you have to look after your children. You do, do, because you made a promise and that promise was eternal. So if you break covenant, there's legal consequences. Breaking an e eternal blood covenant deserves death. That's how Satan looks at it. You broke covenant with me. It was a sexual covenant made in blood. was meant to be eternal. You break it, death. Until today, ex-Satanists who accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior gets persecuted by Satan in their flesh their whole life. That is what Jay has just um, testified about. The circumcision preserved and protected God's people from the wrath of Lucifer, of Satan. And this gives us something about the character of God, that he would even allow that because he's a merciful God. He wants to present. He loves us so much that the lineage of Israelite had to be preserved until the cross. So that Jesus could be born from that lineage. And so that Jesus can take it on the cross. Not that it um, pleased him. Not that he commanded it. But he allowed it to preserve the people. Until the cross. Until Jesus could die for it. The sacrificial system. Where there was atoned for sin. The same principle applies as with circumcision. Satan could accuse mankind before God's throne because of their sin. He's a righteous God. Blood had to atone for the sin. Otherwise, the enemy would have attacked the Israelites in person, in their flesh. God, Jesus Christ, did not want blood. It gave him no pleasure. 
Look what David said in Psalm 51, but there's many other references in the Bible. Psalm 51 verse 16 and 17, For you do not desire sacrifice. You do not delight in burnt offerings. And maybe David is one of the people in the Bible who knew God the most intimate. Because God said he's a man to my own heart. You don't delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. So it means what pleases God is if I am, if I repent for my sin and goes to him and say, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me. The sacrificial system was to preserve God's people. It was necessary due to their broken marriage covenant with Satan and the curse of sin and death. We have the wrong concept of God because of this dualism in the Old Testament. Have you ever had people come to you saying, I don't want to know anything about your God of the Bible. Because if I look at all the bloodshed and all that poor animals that had to pay with their blood and a God that wants babies to be circumcised and all the murder and everything that took place in the Old Testament, I, don't, I want nothing to do with your God. That's not the God I want to serve. And it's because of this dual concept of God in the Old Testament that people have the wrong image and the wrong concept of God. Jesus gave the Israelites a foreshadowing of the tree of life himself that was to come through this external tabernacle. And I've, I've bolded the external in green there. It's important, external. Because the tree of life was not alive internal, the Lord had to give him something external. The content there of the Shabbat and the feasts all of it, you will see later on in the teaching that all of that is a foreshadowing of him, the tree of life that was to come. The tree of life was already with them. That's important. The tree of life, Jesus was with them in the desert, but not yet in them. Marriage proposal of Jesus Christ, the tree of life to his people at Mount Sinai consisted of the proposal he made. He came as the bridegroom and he said to Moses on the mountain, he said, give this 10 commandments to my people, plus repentance and blood sacrifice. The tabernacle with the seven pieces and the Ark of the Covenant. He gave Moses all, all that detail of how the Ark had to look and the tabernacle and everything that needs to be in the tabernacle. The Sabbath, they must keep the Sabbath, the seven feasts of God. And he instituted the ironic priesthood. And he said, this is, this is my marriage proposal. And the Israelites accepted it. They entered into a holy marriage covenant with God. They tabernacled with God. But the promise of a better covenant was already there. Already in Genesis 3 verse 15. This was only a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ that would come, the tree of life. The sign of the old marriage covenant with God. The seal or the sign of the old marriage covenant was the Sabbath. Not the circumcision, the Sabbath. This distinguished God's people from all the other heathen nations. A testimony that they serve the true creator God. Important, not the circumcision that was practiced at the time by many heathen nations in sun God worship. By the way, to, until today, circumcision is still done. We all know it here in tribal Africa as well. We know that it's, it's being done. It's part of their culture. And they are not, they are in sun God worship. They are not in, they're not worshiping the same God than us, those that do the circumcision. Now, this is important. We have to look at the significance of the Ark of the Covenant, and you, you will find out later why it's important. It was the symbol of the holy presence and glory of God amongst his people. Here, the high priest atoned with, his blood, with blood, the blood of an animal, once a year for the sins of the people on the mercy seat. The mercy seat was there in between the two angels, the cherubs, there on top, the mercy seat. God's presence was so holy there in the Holy of Holies that Aaron had bells on the hems of his robe and there was a rope tied to him that, that, that sticked out outside of the Holy of Holies and the other priest had to listen. If they don't hear the bells, they know he's dead and then they can pull him out on the with the rope. They can't go in. Only the high priest can go in. Look how beautiful this is. This is a foreshadowing of Jesus, our hope our high priest, and only him can enter before the throne of the Father to atone for our sins with his blood. The Aaron Haberit, the Holy Ark of the Covenant, is the most sacred artifact in all of Judaism. I get this from Shabbat.org. 
A golden box contained the tablets with the Ten Commandments. The ark stood in the Holy of Holies, the temple's innermost sanctum. It was in the Holy of Holies, the most sacred spot on earth, <coughs> according to them. But at that time, it probably was, that this exact reality was revealed. The ark did occupy space in the natural, and at the same time, it did not. The supernatural. It was the perfect kiss between heaven and earth. What did they say there? What, what do the people in Judaism, in, on Shabbat.org, try to say to us? It was a portal. It was an opening where God met his people, where there was a touch point between the natural and the supernatural, where Aaron, the high priest, could go in and meet with God. Right. The Israelites are harlot bride. First Israel and thereafter Judah worshipped idols. And we cannot go into too depth here. This is, you can read it in the Bible. I think the problem with most of us Christians is that we do not read the Bible properly. We, before we go to sleep at night, we flick it open and we read a few verses and we go to sleep. That's not how you read the Bible. When we started in ministry, the Lord said to me, now you begin at Genesis and you read it in context. Every book, verse by verse by verse, book by book, and you get the context. And I did that twice, twice through the whole Bible, from the beginning until the end. And that's necessary to do that if we want to see the context. Now you can go back and, and see whether this is the truth, but they all worshipped idols. First Israel, they were in complete sun god worship. So they broke Israel, the, the kingdom split after Solomon in Israel and Judah. Israel was in sun god worship from long before Judah, and they actually broke covenant with God long before Judah. And then sun god worship and moon goddess worship, as well as the worship of Tammuz. There's somewhere in one of the prophets, it says that um, the Lord sent the prophet in and says, go look in the temple how the women cry for Tammuz. Right. They did not heed the warnings of God through the prophets that they are breaking covenant. Many prophets were sent by the Lord warning the people, saying, you are breaking covenant, you are worshipping idols, you must repent, you must repent, you must repent. Jeremiah 3 verse 8, And I saw when for all the causes whereby black backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. What does Jeremiah say there? They, and the Spirit of the Lord was speaking through him. First the Lord divorced Israel and then he divorced Judah, not because he's not faithful, because they were unfaithful and they broke covenant. The Israelites are divorced people. They did not heed the warnings of the prophets and broke covenant with God. We know, if you read in the Bible, what they did with Jeremiah. They threw him in a pit. They almost killed him. They killed many of the prophets. Jerusalem was put under siege by Nebuchadnezzar. Go and read in Jeremiah what a city under siege looks like and how they say there in, in that book of Jeremiah how the people had to start eating the flesh of their own people because the city under siege is you cannot go out and you are encircled by the enemy. You have no food, you have no water, you have nothing. It's terrible. Is this, is this an image of a covenant that is still standing with their God? I don't think so. I think the Lord divorced them because of their own harlotry. They broke covenant. And they were warned and they were warned and they were warned. The Lord was so merciful and faithful, but no. The Israelites were taken in exile in Bab to Babylon, divorced by God. And this is an important thing to understand. I did not realize that until we did this teaching. And it's again, the Holy Spirit just showed me, he said to me, the Buddha, remember there's something like the first temple period and the second temple period. He said, oh, Lord, I don't know about that. He said, go read, go look. It's important. I said, Lord, is it really important? This teaching is long enough already. He says, it's important. Go look. The first temple period ended at the time when the Israelites were taken in exile to Babylon. The first temple period was the time of the ark. When the tabernacle and later the temple, when the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies and where God met his people. The Ark was the symbol of God's presence. During the exile to Babylon, nobody knows what happened to the Ark until today. There's many theories, but it did not return. 
70 years were they under the influence of Babylonian religion. How many generations of people is that, do you think? Two, three generations. What can happen in a generation? Two, three generations. If you are under the influence of pagan religions, and you are sep separated from your own religion and temple practices and priesthood and everything. There was nothing. And they were under this influence of Babylon. The scribes and the rabbis of Israel ex were exposed to the mysteries in Babylon, Kabbalah. That's where they were exposed to the Babylonian mysteries. Then we all know that a remnant returned. And I believe it's much like in the day that we live in now, a day and age. Many people will fall away from, from the faith, but the Lord preserves a remnant with whom he has a plan. But a remnant returned under the leadership of Ezra, the priest, and Nehemiah, who rebuilt the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. That is the start of the second temple period, and it started in 516 before Christ until 70 after Christ. Now here is the important thing. And it may sound to you as if we're spending time on things that is background. It's not background. It's essential for you to understand the rest. The important thing is the Ark of the Covenant no longer resides in the temple in Jerusalem. The Holy of Holies was empty. I read on the internet, I can't recall who it was. It was some Roman emperor or something, someone that wanted to see what it looks like in the temple of the Israelites in the Holy of Holies. And he expected to find something there. And it's, I read it, but I can't recall where it was. He, he said he was so disappointed because when he came in there, it was empty. Nothing in there, nothing. The ark did not return. Nobody knows what exactly happened to the ark. God no longer tabernacled externally with his people. Because it wasn't internally. The seed was still dead. Oh, not the seed. The seed was there. I'm... I'm I'm saying the tree of life in them was not yet germinated and alive because it had to be externally, it can't be internally because they were still, they went in covenant with Lucifer, they broke covenant with Lucifer, but they, they now actually broke covenant with God again. So the second temple period was without the manifest presence and glory of God. So they were busy with religion. And in their hearts, they seeked God. And I know you will all agree that Ezra and Nehemiah and the remnant that returned was really faithful. They wanted to worship the true God. And they, were, they repented. It says there in the, at the end of Ezra that they, they even sent away their heathen uh, wives and children. They repented. They wanted to come clean. They wanted to start over. But 400 years had to go past before Jesus came, before Jesus was born. So that was a period where the people waited. They were in waiting for the new covenant, but there was nothing. There wasn't God did not tabernacle with them. So the importance for us to understand this is anybody that says to you, the new covenant is not a new covenant. It's just a renewal of the old covenant. It's so far from the truth. It can't be further from the truth. The old covenant was no more, even before Jesus came. The old covenant was no more. And the Lord showed me, the Buddha, the proof of that, because I, that's how I talk with the Lord. If, if, if I write the teaching, I said, Lord, how, what's the proof of that? I, and the Lord said, where's the ark, the Buddha? Go read what they say about the ark. The ark was the touch point where God met his people. Touch point between the supernatural, the spiritual realm, and the natural realm where, where the where the high priest could go in and he could atone, he could atone. Remember, if he couldn't atone with the blood on the mercy seat, then there was no atonement. Yes, Jesus replaced the old ark. But in this period, Correct. the second temple period, there was a temple, they were busy with religious services and things, but God's holy presence, his manifest presence, as it was in the desert where the cloud came and filled the tabernacle, was no longer there. The Israelites are divorced people. It's important to understand that the old marriage covenant was cancelled by God. There was a divorce. For 400 years, God did not speak. We call it the intertestamental period. But we shouldn't see this as that God was not faithful. He remained faithful 
because his plan was still in place. He said, but I will send my son at the right time. He will come. Important, in the law of contract, a cancelled contract cannot be revived or renewed. People who studied law, contract, law of contract, you will know that once a contract is cancelled, you cannot revive or renew it. Then you must enter into a new contract. That's why sometimes in law, they put a clause in that sort of makes provision for certain things that happen that can renew the contract automatically. For if the contract had lapsed and is cancelled, it cannot just, then you have to enter again into a new, you can't blow life into the old contract again. It's important for us to understand this. It's contract law. And the law, and our, our, our Jesus Christ is, is, is the sovereign judge in the courts of heaven. So he works with law. He's righteous. If the contract was cancelled and it lapsed, it was divorced, it was divorced. You can't revive it. <clears throat> so a new contract had to be entered into. What did Jeremiah prophesy in Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34? He said, after the Israelites were taken captive in exile to Babylon, he said, Our merciful God promises, I will make a new covenant. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. They will know me and I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will not remember. Again, doesn't this show us something of the wonderful Jesus that we serve? After everything that the people did, all their harlotry, he remained faithful. Sometimes it's too much for my human mind to understand, really, that the Lord is so faithful, so merciful, and so loving. And it gives us hope as well that the Lord, if he could have so much grace and mercy upon the Israelites, to still, after so much harlotry and so much breaking of covenant by them, he kept his word and he sent his only son to die in our place. A brand new marriage covenant. This must sink in, not a renewed, a brand new marriage covenant. The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, came in flesh. He was crucified. He descended to hell and he atoned or paid once off for all the sins of mankind with his own godly blood. Only the blood of the Lamb of God could break the curse of sin. He died in our place. He was resurrected by God the Father on the third day, and now he reigns at the right hand of God the Father again. Again, a marriage proposal to each and every human being on earth. All who accept him, Jesus Christ, as Savior will be saved and will inherit eternal life. And the curse, that tremendous curse of sin that started in the Garden of Eden can be broken by the blood of the Lamb, if we accept him.